Our scripture reading this morning will be in Luke 9, verses 57 through 62. As they were going along, going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, Allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Thank you. you may be seated. Not sure if there's a junior church this morning. Does anybody know? Okay. Huh? I guess not. You guys are staying up here today. I'm sure you young people will be able to uh, follow along. You're getting old enough that you can. In 1997, there was an Associated Press article that talked about the uptick in puppies that were being donated to dog shelters around the country. And it wasn't just any dogs, it was particularly Dalmatians. There's one organization called Dalmatian Rescue that in 1997 took in over 130 Dalmatians. And they uh, normally took that many in in uh, over several years, and they took that many in just in the first seven months of 1997. Well, why was that? Well, everyone pretty much acknowledges that it had something to do with the fact that in 1996, Disney released another version of the live action version of 101 Dalmatians. And it was a pretty big box office success, and people saw these lovable, cute little puppies that were bouncing around the screen and had to have one, too. The uh, people that work with those kind of dogs said that a lot of times people would get the puppies and then within a couple of months realize what a huge commitment that was. Um, they, the dogs grow up to be uh, typically at least 70 pounds, so they're pretty big dogs, and then they're rambunctious. Um, they, like, they need a lot of exercise, and if they don't get a lot of exercise, they get um, destructive and moody, which I guess is probably a lot of dogs that are like that. They shed year-round, and actually 10% of Dalmatians, they say, are actually born deaf. So a lot of times, the upkeep that was required for these dogs, um, people weren't prepared for. Um, one lady said, a, a spokesman for the Wisconsin Humane Society said, although Dalm Dalmatians are beautiful puppies and can be wonderful dogs, you have to know what you're getting into. So there were a lot of people that loved the idea of getting a Dalmatian puppy, but then when they actually came to get it in the everyday, they realized there was more to it than they expected. And we see something similar in our text this morning. Jesus encounters these three potential followers, and we find out that they are a lot like us, there's things that we are hoping in life that are going to be cheap and easy. If you're getting a dog, you kind of hope it's going to be cheap and easy. If you go to the store, the way they try to get you to buy things is by convincing you that it's cheap and easy, right? There's like little prices slashed out that are much higher numbers that they never actually sold it for to make it you think that you're getting a discount. You know, you go to buy toilet paper and there's all this confusing math where you're, you're actually only buying 12 rolls, but each roll is actually worth three, so they're telling you. It's like getting 36 rolls, and you're sitting there trying to do the math or even counting to see how many are you actually buying, right? Because they're trying to convince you that you're getting a deal. They're trying to convince you that it's a shortcut. 
If you spend any amount of time scrolling through videos online, you'll quickly find these videos that are life hacks, right? Quick, easy shortcuts to make things go better quickly in your life. Because we all love the idea of life being easier. And Jesus' words here in this text this morning run directly against that. We're expecting that following Jesus is going to be easy. And we like the idea of following Jesus. But Jesus here says that the commitment is actually a lot higher. If you remember, as we've been going through Luke chapter 9 here, it's been a theme on dis- of discipleship, right? The disciples in ever, are showing up in every story, and it typically hasn't been a pretty picture. The disciples are basically blowing it at every turn. Every single time that the disciples come up, they're, they're sleeping during the transfiguration. They tried to cast out a demon. They couldn't. They tried to um, tell Jesus that they needed, he needed to call down fire on this village that had rejected them. Um, so the disciples have not exactly been hitting it out of the park here. And you would actually think that Jesus would say, maybe it's time to get a few new recruits in here. Maybe it's time to get some new followers because these guys aren't doing too good. And here's some potential people that come up to follow him as he's going to Jerusalem where he's going to be crucified. And Jesus, instead of kind of lowering the standard and saying, yeah, maybe we need to get some more people in here, Jesus actually raises the standard. Jesus actually says discipleship is harder than any of you were even thinking. The fact is, is that Jesus doesn't describe following him as an easy kind of walk in the park, no problems experience. Jesus doesn't offer like the seven-day trial or a 30-day trial. You know, those companies that kind of hope that you'll sign up for something and then forget that you signed up for it. Just try him out for a while. Just see how it goes. That's not Jesus' approach in calling disciples to him. Jesus describes the cost of following himself as something that is high. There's no shortcuts There's no life hacks that's going to make it easier or softer or more comfortable. So let's look at these verses this morning and see what Jesus is saying here in no uncertain terms, that following him is costly. Following him is costly. Something very interesting that happens in the text here and the way that Luke writes it up that Luke doesn't give us any of the details of the people that come up to ask about following Jesus. None of these people's occupations, their names, um, any other details about their life, any other details about their response of really what they say to what Jesus uh, says to them isn't recorded. It's just left blank. And I think it's left blank there on purpose because the issue isn't what actually ended up happening with these three people. The issue is, what is your heart's response to following Jesus? Are you going to follow Jesus or not? So the details are purposely left blank so that you can read your own life into the story and say, how do I respond to what Jesus is saying here? So let's look at what Jesus says about the cost of following him. First of all, Jesus says that if you want to follow him, it's going to cost you comfort. There's this guy that, as they're going on the road to Jerusalem, comes and seeks out Jesus, and he says something that sounds great. It sounds good. He says, I will follow you wherever you go. That sounds great. A little bit like the rich young ruler when he comes up to Jesus. I mean, this guy is prime prospect material. But apparently, this person had motives that were really not a hundred percent good right they said i'm going to follow you wherever you go and if you and i heard somebody say that by the way we would have to say that's great you want to follow jesus jesus knows this person's heart and apparently they weren't really willing to go wherever jesus was going because jesus says to him the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head Jesus says, if you sign up to follow me, there's going to be some uncomfortable times. It wasn't going to be all four-star hotel accommodations. It was going to be hard sometimes. Remember, it was only a couple of verses ago that Jesus was literally looking for a place to stay for the night, and the village told him he couldn't stay there. So this wasn't just theoretical. 
This has actually just happened. And of course, Jesus is going to Jerusalem where he's going to be crucified. So it's not like Jesus is about to embark on a luxury cruise. Jesus is about to suffer and die. And apparently, this person was not prepared to pay that price. Jesus actually says here that you'll be, at times, less comfortable than animals if you decide to follow him. Birds have nests. Foxes have holes. Fox, at the end of the day, has a place to crawl back into. A bird flies around. It gets tired. It actually has a place to go to. Jesus says, there's times that I don't even know where I'm going to sleep. And by implication is, if you're following me, there's going to be some times that you don't know where you're going to sleep. There's obviously an idea of wealth and possessions here. Even back in this day and age, most people would have had a home of some type, that they would have had a bed of some type that they would have been able to go home. And Jesus says here, the Son of Man, talking about himself, has no place to lay his head. But it's even more, it seems like Jesus is talking about comfort, security, right? If you think about it, every single person here, I'm guessing, I don't know absolutely everyone here, but most people at the end know, you know where tonight you're going to sleep. You, probably, you have a bed, you have a pillow, you probably have a favorite side of the pillow, right? Um, we have air conditioners, which we're very thankful for this time of year. Um, in the winter, we're thankful for heaters so the temperature can stay okay. Because we, for the most part, are used to that pretty basic, pretty foundational level of accommodation, of, of comfort and security. If you, if you talk to somebody who said, yeah, I don't even know where I'm going to sleep tonight, you would say that person is, is in a rough situation. That's not a good um, place to be in. And Jesus says that if you decide to follow me, there are going to be some times that following me is that uncomfortable. Now, I'm guessing that for most of us here, you are not going to be called to give up the place that you sleep at night in order to follow him. There are missionaries that do that. There are missionaries, and we support some of them around the world, that they gave up their homes, they gave up the comfortable places they were in so that they could go and spread the gospel to new places. I remember not too long ago, a couple of years ago, a, a young missionary couple came to present their work here and they had just started out on deputation. They had lived in around family their whole life. Um, they had lived in a, a Christian environment in the South. And I still remember the girl getting up and talking about what it was like to leave all that behind. They, they were going to Indonesia. And she said it with tears in her eyes. But she knew that she was giving all that up so that she could go and spread the gospel. So that, there are brothers and sisters in Christ that are called to give that up. It's possible that maybe the Lord is calling one of you here to do that. But Jesus, I believe, is giving that as an example of the willingness to give up comfort in order to follow him. The most basic foundational comfort and security that you have. Where are you going to go to sleep tonight? You should be willing to give up in order to follow him. Is your commitment to Christ that serious, that wholehearted? Jesus might call you to an uncomfortable situation. Jesus might call you to an uncomfortable conversation with another brother or sister in Christ that you need to have. Would you be willing to do that for Jesus? Jesus might call you to inconvenience yourself for another person in the body or maybe for a neighbor that you're trying to reach out to that would cause you maybe to leave, lose some sleep even. Would you be willing to do that for Jesus? The Lord could cause you, call you to a, an uncomfortable financial situation. Not that you're foolish or do anything dangerous with your, or, or unwise with your money. But what if, because you're faithfully, generously giving to the Lord with your tithe, 
you don't have some of the money that you would like to have with the comfort and security that you, you, would, it would, be, you would prefer. If Jesus called you to that, would you be willing to do that? Whatever the exact comfort is, Jesus' words are really clear here. If you're with him, he's going to take you to some places that are not easy. This guy comes up to him and says, Jesus, I'm right here with you. I'm following you wherever you go. And Jesus says, wait a second. There's going to be some places I go, some times that I don't even know where I'm going to sleep that night. And apparently, it was a deal breaker for this guy. He kind of backs up slowly and fades into the crowd. He's like, whoa, wait a second. I'm not, I'm not ready for that kind of level of serious commitment to follow this guy. Do we still follow Jesus when it's hard? Remember, Timothy, or Paul's going to write to Timothy a little bit later on, and he says, Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. So Paul uses a, a, another analogy really to explain this verse that Jesus, um, that we're looking at this morning, that it's like being a, a soldier. We have a couple of soldiers that are in our congregation. You can ask Ken or ask Eric if being a soldier sometimes is hard, right? It's not a life of ease and comfort all the time. We have to understand that there is an, an inconvenience and an uncomfortableness at times in following Jesus. That's part of the cost. Jesus has told us that from the beginning. Jesus doesn't wait until you're 30 days in of being a follower of him to say, oh, by the way, this is going to be real hard. Jesus tells you up front, sometimes you're going to have to be willing to give up comfort. I remember I had a, a roommate in college who decided to join the Marines. And uh, when he was talking to the recruiter, the recruiter told him that he could uh, be uh, part of the bomb disposal unit for the Marines. I don't remember exactly what that unit was called. It was one of their kind of special units. And this guy was so excited about going into bomb disposable, you know, basically like the, um, you know, the bomb squad for the Marines. And he thought maybe he would get into underwater bomb disposal. He was imagining, you know, trying to figure out which wire to clip, the red or the green wire, and um, studying all that. He was all excited about it. So he joined the Marines. And um, I, I didn't it was back a little bit before when cell phones were just kind of getting popular, and so I lost touch with them. I didn't have his number or anything, and about a year or two later, the, my, the phone in my room rang, and it was him. He had looked me up on the college, you know, switchboard and called, and they directed him to my room, and I was talking to him, and I was like, how's the Marines? Like, how was basic training and everything? And I said, you know, how is it like being in the bomb disposal unit? And he's like, oh, no, that didn't happen. Um, he, like, like one of the very first tests that he took for that, um, he didn't qualify for it. And he was in Japan driving bulldozers. Um, so I'm guessing, and I could be wrong here, that that recruiter probably didn't tell him the whole story, right? The recruiter sold him a line of, hey, this is going to be great. This is going to be easy. This is going to be doing everything that you love. And he got into the Marines and found out, oh, well, maybe that's not all how it worked. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus has told us up front that there's going to be times that following him requires a lack of comfort. So as we give people the gospel, I think that there's at times that we present Christianity to people for the first time that are interested in becoming followers of Christ. We need to be up front with them. We need to tell them that sometimes following Jesus is hard. Um, Jesus does love you. Jesus does have a wonderful plan for your life. But sometimes that plan for your life includes hard things. So as we give the gospel and disciple people, we need to bring up verses like this to them. And it's not just the fact that it's hard and that's it. It's the fact of it's hard, but Jesus is worth it. That following Jesus is actually worth this wholehearted commitment. And I think that it's something that should be a reminder to us when we experience inconvenience, when we are um, uncomfortable because of we're serving other Christians or we're giving the way that God's called us to give. 
we should remember these words of Jesus and say, oh yeah, Jesus said that this would happen. This is one of those times where Jesus' words are coming true. Following Jesus will cost you your comfort. But I want you to look at these verses and notice the second thing with the second and third people that come up to Jesus, that following Jesus will cost you your family. The next man actually doesn't come up to Jesus. Jesus actually invites this guy. Jesus goes up to somebody and says, follow me. And I think a lot of times, I don't know about you, but I think about people that Jesus goes up to and says, follow me. You think about Matthew, right, the tax collector that left his booth by the side of the road. You think about the, the fishermen, Peter, James, and John, that were fishing and they left their nets and their boats by the side of the, you know, on the, on the shore there and walked away from them. And we typically think that most people or all people that Jesus goes up to and says, hey, follow me, that they followed him. But here we find out that Jesus' invitation wasn't always accepted. Jesus went up to some people and said, follow me. And they said, yes, but, and then you'll see in both of these situations, they give a condition. All on board with following you, Jesus. Sounds good. I'm right there with you. Show me where to sign. But just by the way, one other little condition. You've got to put that in here. Make sure if you've got to do this, Jesus, and then I'm going to follow you. This has to work out, and then I'm going to follow you. And Jesus says, that's not how it works. What does this guy say? Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. This is a very reasonable, common sense request when you first think about it and look at it. This guy wants to be there to bury his dad when he dies. Now, there's a lot of debate about this verse. There's really two different ways that you can take it. Some people say that, you know, his dad maybe was up there in years and maybe was sick, but that he actually hadn't passed away yet. Because in Jewish uh, society, once somebody passed away, he would have been considered unclean. He would have been a part of the ceremony uh, that would have lasted uh, seven to ten days of, of burying the body, and he wouldn't have been out in society. So they think, well, probably this guy, it wasn't that he was like on the, his way to the funeral. It was just his kind of way of saying nicely, hey, you know, my dad is kind of up there in years, and once he passes away and I get the inheritance from him and I get all that stuff squared away, then I'm going to start following you, Jesus. That's one possibility. The other possibility is, is that even if his dad had just recently passed away, the way that the Jewish um, burial rites go, they would, they would put the body in one place, like in a, a cave, um, that would let the body decompose, and then they would pick up the bones and put them into a box and then put them in a separate place. And so that would take at least a solid year. So maybe he was saying that he was in the middle of that process and he needed to be there for that. The, the point is that we really don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us. The point isn't really about the timing. The issue isn't, Jesus doesn't bring up a problem with timing here of, no, that's going to take too much time. You're going to have to be away. Jesus brings up an issue of priority. Jesus says to this man something that is, quite frankly, harsh. It's shocking. He says, let the dead bury their own dead. And regardless, I think sometimes you can get focused in on oh, what exactly was this guy doing, what was happening in his life, and why did Jesus say this to him? But the point is, what Jesus says to this man is shocking, and it would have been offensive to anybody that was alive back then, just as offensive as it would have been today. Because socially, culturally, religiously, this man had an obligation to take care of his father and his business and his possessions. That was the expectation of him that was placed in the day. That was the priority that everybody would have assumed was correct. And Jesus here, I believe purposely, uses shocking language to tell him that your priorities as a follower of Jesus Christ have to be radically different. Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. Which is, is on its, uh, itself, Jesus purposely trying to kind of wake us up. A dead person can't actually bury a dead person. So that's why Jesus is, I think, purposely using almost language that's uh, uh, 
designed to get our attention here. Because Jesus says, your priorities are wrong. You've got the wrong emphasis. Here's what you actually are, should be doing. You go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, your priority is not what your family expects of you. It's not what society expects of you. Your priority is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what he has given you to do. It was unpopular back then. I would say it's just as unpopular today. And I got to be honest with you, as I read those verses, I wonder, do we have that kind of urgency and priority on sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with the people around us? We have duties and expectations for our families, whether that's spouses, whether that's children, whether that's extended family or neighbors or just friends. We have a certain amount of, of duties and expectations that they place on us. And we should be fulfilling those. Obviously, Jesus never says it's wrong to go to a funeral. Jesus never says it's wrong to love your family and care for them. In fact, the scriptures say you're supposed to be taking care of, your, especially your immediate family. That's part of your responsibility. But at the end of the day, what is your top priority? What is it that you are to be urgently doing as a follower of Jesus Christ? Sharing the gospel, proclaiming the kingdom, telling everyone that Jesus has come, that he's the king, and that the kingdom is on its way. That is what he's called us to do. And a lot of times, a lot of people say that they're interested in following Jesus, but when family acceptance and expectations come into play, then they say, well, no, i got to do this for my family. I, I, this, is what I, this, is, this is what everybody knows I'm supposed to be doing, so of course I'm going to do this. And Jesus is here telling us that's not true. Our highest priority is to him. And just like with comfort, God doesn't call us to be uncomfortable all the time. And just like, and with the same thing with family, it's not that God is calling you to totally forsake every member, every relationship of your, in your family and never see them again. That's obviously not what God is saying. He's talking about priority. What's first? What is it that's the main business of your life? The next potential follower has another to be honest with you, even more reasonable requests than the first guy. And it has to do with family too. Another guy comes up to him and says, Lord, I will follow you. But first, there's the condition. Permit me to say goodbye to those at home. There's another time where if you were sitting there next to Jesus, you'd be thinking, that's fine. <laughs> right? What's the big deal for somebody to go and say goodbye to the people at home? He says he's going to follow. He says he wants to follow. If you read uh, in 1 Kings 19, when Elijah calls Elisha, he calls Elisha, he's out plowing, and Elisha sacrifices the, the animals that he was plowing with, and he um, just, you know, burns the plow, and he says, yeah, I'm going to follow you, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Elijah says, all right, go ahead, that's fine. So it, it seems like a reasonable request. And here again, if we were standing there, we wouldn't know this person's heart. Jesus obviously does. And you could also make the same kind of argument as with the first thing as far as like, well, how long were they going to go back for, right? What if they were going to go back and, you know, do like a seven-day feast with them to say goodbye or say goodbye to them for a year? But it isn't the length of time here, again, that Jesus is focused on. Jesus doesn't say, oh, well, if you want to go say goodbye for 15 minutes, it would be fine. But if it's going to be seven days, then that's too long. It isn't an issue of time. Jesus says it's an issue of focus. What does he say to this person? Jesus says to them, uh, oh, I, somehow this verse didn't make it into my PowerPoint. No one, verse 62, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus asked this person, where is your focus? What is it that you are zeroed in on? So this request to say goodbye wasn't just a simple request. It was rooted 
in a, someone who had a wrong focus. Jesus uses the example here of somebody operating a plow. You've probably seen pictures of it or you've seen it in a movie. You've got the animal hooked up to a harness, a horse, an ox, a, a mule, and it has reins that connect to the, the bit that would control the animal that you would need to have around your neck probably. The plow would require two hands. There's no one-handed plows. You need both hands to push that blade into the soil. And the whole idea of doing that is that you're trying to get straight rows, right? The closest thing, you know, we would have a similar idea of you know, you're trying to mow your lawn. If you're trying to mow the lawn, you're trying to get it in straight rows. And if you're sitting there trying to mow and you're looking behind you the whole time, you're, gonna, you're, you're not going to mow straight at all. You to plow with reins around your neck and, and trying to, you really already need a third hand between the reins and the two hands on the plow. And if you're not looking forward and you started looking backward, before long, you would have the most hilarious plot of ground in the, in the whole neighborhood. People would be laughing at you. That your, your crop wouldn't work because there would be no good places to plant the seed. We would, look at, we would even think about it today, you know, if you try to drive just by looking in the rearview mirror, it's only a matter of time till you crash. Jesus is saying there's an issue here with focus. And this person was not focused on the kingdom of God. This person was not focused on Jesus and on following him. This person was focused behind them. This person was focused on the things they had left behind and things in the past. And what does Jesus say about that person? Jesus says they're not fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus doesn't say, if you're not really fully devoted to me and focused on me, then hey, maybe you're just not like the greatest follower of mine. Jesus says, you're not ready for the kingdom of God. In other words, you're not one of my followers. We're obviously called to love our extended family, our spouses, our children, our parents. We should seek to obey the Bible and honor God in those different relationships. But Jesus is telling us here that it's possible for us to have a focus on our family that is looking backward instead of on him. We can care more about what our family thinks of us. We can care more about the duties and expectations that we have in our families than we care about Jesus himself. That's a danger. And it's a possibility that it could take us out of the kingdom. In other words, somebody who says, oh yeah, I'm following Jesus, but ultimately they end up not being a follower of Jesus because they don't want to pay that price. Three people come up to Jesus and they all three don't end up following him. Why is that? Comfort and family. And, and when we get to eternity, there are going to be large numbers of people that are not in heaven because they chose comfort and family over Jesus Christ himself. So Jesus actually tells them up front, here's what I'm saying to you, following me is going to be costly. It's a warning to us that if we want to follow him, we have to have a wholehearted commitment to him. We sing that hymn sometimes, though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. I think it's worth thinking about. It's worth considering. If other people that were close to you stopped following Jesus, would you keep following him? you've grown up in a Christian home, you've, you've grown up with family that was following Jesus, and so it's kind of easy to go along with the crowd with that. Even you can be a part of a church and everyone else is following Jesus, so you kind of just think you're in that mix too. But what if some of the people that were closest to you stopped following Jesus? Would you still find him worthy of following that's part of what Jesus is saying here, that following him isn't conditional on what something else, on something that somebody else does. They're following Jesus, or they're doing this, so yeah, okay, I'm going to follow. Following him is costly. There's no way that we can live for comfort 
and live for our family's approval and live for Jesus. That's what we're always trying to do. And Jesus says that's not how it works. So the question is, who's willing to pay this price? Right? Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you can follow me, but the price is high. You've got to be willing to give up your comfort at times, and you're going to have to be willing at times to give up family. Who's willing to do that? Part of the answer is not a lot of people. These people turn away. It sounded good on the surface. It looked good at first. They loved the idea of it, but then they got close to it, and they're like, ah, this is too costly. Jesus considers a, encourages us to count the cost. So I just want to ask everybody here, are you willing to pay that price? I don't, I don't know what God is doing in your life. I don't know where you're at in your walk with Christ. But is that a price that you're willing to pay? At the end of the day, this takes us back to Jesus himself. I love what Ligon Duncan said on this passage. He said, the cost of discipleship boils down to how important you think Jesus is. Because the only way that Jesus could say, follow me, and give up comfort, give up family, is that he is saying, I am worth it. Temporary comfort in this life is not better than Jesus himself. The approval and acceptance and duties and expectations that your family might have on you is not as good as knowing that you are right with the King of Heaven. So it takes you back. How valuable do you believe Jesus Christ himself is? It's possible that somebody's here this morning and you have never made that decision to follow Christ. Maybe you've just kind of liked the initial idea of following Jesus. You like how it sounded. But maybe God is working in your heart this morning that today, even if you've been coming to church for a long time, maybe you've even grown up in a Christian home, but you've never made the decision to follow Jesus yourself. You've counted the cost. You know that it's going to be uncomfortable and inconvenient sometimes, and sometimes it might cost you some, some opposition within your family, but you're saying it's still worth it because you're turning away from your sin and you're trusting in what Jesus has done for you on the cross. As believers, these verses are important reminders for us too. One commentator on this text, I think, applied it well. He said, regularly, God tests the earnestness of our hearts by bringing them into a fork in the road. When it becomes necessary to choose between two ways, which way do we follow? Comfort, custom, convention, or Christ? The test from the very outset has been, follow me. So maybe you're a follower of Jesus Christ here this morning, and God has you at a little fork in the road. Maybe you can look back in your past week, your past month, past year, and see where God has brought you to a fork in the road. And have you been hesitant to pay that price of comfort? You don't want to give up that security. Have you been hesitant to, to face opposition at times maybe from your family? Or to not place the highest priority on what they think and what they're saying you should do and instead follow Jesus? Which one are you following? Because as believers, we found over and over again that Jesus is worth it, Right? That when Jesus says, follow me, that's the best possible invitation that we could get, and it's the best possible invitation that you could follow. Consider that cost, but also consider the fact that he is worth it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words from your son, Jesus Christ, that are not easy to hear. We would love to find some way to follow you that would cost us nothing. But your son Jesus Christ has told us from the beginning that following him is going to be hard. So we thank you for the, the honesty from your word. Um, we thank you for the, 
the boldness um, to tell us the truth. Lord, I, I pray for anyone here that's here this morning that doesn't know you. Maybe they still think that they can kind of half follow you and half follow one of these other things. Lord, would you open up their eyes to that and show them the true wholehearted commitment that it takes to follow you and show them that there is no in-between. Lord, would you help us in this coming week as we have that fork in the road, that option between following comfort, following convenience, following other people's expectations, and following your son Jesus Christ. Would you, um, by the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to follow your son Jesus Christ even when it's hard? Because you've told us from the beginning that this is what it was going to be like. Lord, we ask all of this in your son's name. Amen.